overview of the book of Revelation, session two, the paradox, or the entry of the main characters onto the theatrical ground. Remember, we're dealing with the book of Revelation as though it were some kind of a Greek tragedy or that started with a prologue, what this is about. Today, the paradox, who are the main actors, that will be followed by five episodes that overlap, and we will end then, Lord willing, with the Exodus as the characters march off the stage. Today's session, however, deals with the present time, not so much with the future, but there will be some future pieces. My learning objectives, primarily for me, were first to identify Jesus' angel, then secondly, to locate the seven churches of Asia Minor, which will be easy, for we have a map. And then thirdly, to analyze Jesus' approvals, warnings, promises, and predictions for those seven historical churches. Let's get into the text. It's rich and full. I, John, your brother, who share with you the persecution and the kingdom and the endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. All right, is there something that stands out to you? You'd like to comment or perhaps ask about? He says he was in the spirit. Makes me question, was it physically not there or? Good question. <laughs> Did he disappear <laughs> off into the spirit realm? Hmm. Let's come back around to that. Well, the sharing in persecution and the endurance, because John is also being persecuted along with others. Right. And I think the main thing is, you know, during, during those things, you know, with the persecution and whatever, whatever that may entail is the endurance to Stay focused, stay focused to our salvation. Jesus had warned his apostles that there would be a lot of persecution, that some would actually lose their life because of their testimony. And so John is not surprised. At the same time, other ordinary Christians who endured the same kinds of sufferings, they see that their leaders have no special privilege. And so we can look to those leaders for encouragement if they can endure the persecution, they can teach us to do the same. Now, did you see the parallel with the text that we had in the service this morning? The sharing mm -hmm. in the persecutions, but also in the divine nature. So, if there was a persecution going on, was this one of the official persecutions? Or was it imperial, provincial, or local? If it was imperial, then we had two main periods, the persecutions under Nero, later on under Domitian. So this partly reflects upon when this book was written. So it could have been written as early as the, the 60s, and, but no later than the 90s. Well, it could have been under, under Domitian because, you know, John even says John was in exile, and Domitian exiled a lot of people. But the persecutions and stuff, maybe not from you know government officials, but non-believing Jews with, with believing Jews. That's a possibility as well, because that did in fact happen. What he says, I'm a participant with you guys in the kingdom, the persecution, um, the patience, uh, but also he says in Jesus. When you see a little phrase like that, you, we should normally ask ourselves. What was in Jesus? Go back and look at the verse. Share, I share with you in the persecution and the kingdom and the endurance in Jesus. What does in Jesus modify? What the does that connect to? Hmm? The kingdom and endurance. Um, all right. Some say it connects with endurance, others with kingdom. Why not go back to the first noun? Another possibility that has to do with Greek grammar. It probably modifies, I am your brother in Jesus. 
On the island of Patmos, what do, you, what do we know about Patmos Island? Run about water. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It wasn't very far off the coast, about as near to Ephesus as you can. We also know from archaeology that this was a this island had residences on it. It had towns and synagogues. And so this was not a prison island, but it was separated by enough water to keep John out of Ephesus. He could no longer travel amongst the churches. Exiles could be by imperial decision, but also provincial leaders could do the same thing. But he said it was because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The word of God would have meant? You're right, yeah, the Hebrew Bible primarily. But then he adds on the testimony of Jesus. In English, the phrase of Jesus uh, is rather ambiguous. The testimony that Jesus gave, or could it be just his life? All right. Could it be the testimony that others bear about him or to him? Or anybody's testimony that talks about Jesus? However, the word of God refers to the Hebrew Bible, then testimony of Jesus likely refers to Christian content. And if this was the early persecution, then the Gospels had not yet been written, although they already existed verbally. If it's the later persecution, then they had all been written. So, come back to in the Spirit. <laughs> I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Well, where he, does he tell us where he was when this happened? Was he off floating somewhere in the Spirit? Or he was still on the island of Patmos, and he was still seeing things and hearing things. I'd like to suggest that he was having a spiritual experience, which Jesus had promised to his apostles, that when the Holy Spirit would come, the Spirit would remind them that of all that Jesus had said, testimony of Jesus, and would reveal to them the things that were yet to come. This text serves as that kind of transition. We have this interesting phrase, on the Lord's Day. Typically, Bible commentators will say, well, that means Sunday. Don't we call Sunday the Lord's Day? <laughs> there are two places in the New Testament talk about the first day of the week, not, not called the Lord's Day. And in one of them, on the first day of the week, the Christians are meeting together, and Paul is talking, a young man falls asleep because of the sitting in the window where the fumes from all of the candles and lamps went out, he apparently became asphyxiated and fell out the window. What does that tell you about the time of day? Probably in the evening. Probably in the evening. And so when the first day of the week started when? What hour? Started in the evening. And therefore the first day of the week when the Christians meeting must have been Saturday evening, not Sunday morning. The practice of some early Christians being Jewish was to attend synagogue, daytime, and then in the evening go to celebrate the Lord's table. When you look at that verse, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and that's not the end of the sentence. It goes on, what does it say, the next half of the sentence? And I heard behind me a loud voice, write on a scroll what right. you see and send it to seven churches. Right, and then it goes on to say, what are you to write about? About the things you've seen and the things that are, that are to come. And so the suggestion here of interpreters, many interpreters, is that this phrase, the Lord's Day, could be translated, I was, in the spirit, I was projected into the day of the Lord. Because that's exactly what this book is dealing with. So that Old Testament Hebrew idea of the coming day of the Lord, when Yahweh would come uh, down onto earth, one way or another, to judge the evil nations, to rescue Israel, to bring them into the promised land, and to raise their King David back to life. That was the day of the Lord. Otherwise, why would it be important to mention the day of the week? Oh, and also, in the first century, nobody was calling Sunday the Lord's Day, that decades or centuries later. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. Good, thank you. Oh, all right, what do you observe? 
Okay, the lampstands, we're going to find out later what that represents. One like the Son of Man. Well, if this was one like the Son of Man, was it the Son of Man? Or is it someone else? It could have been either or. Either or, linguistically, yeah. He didn't know. Possibly didn't know, just someone like the Son of Man. If anyone is interested, you could look up for us Daniel 7, 13, and read it aloud when you find it. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Right. Okay, that was the, what Daniel said, his exact words was, one like a son of man. So was that something else that just looked like a son of man, or was that possibly his way of saying, I saw a human being? In fact, the way it's constructed in Hebrew, most likely means, I saw this individual, I'm going to tell you what, what he looked like. He was a son of man. He was a human being. And then it goes on to say, that human being was given an everlasting kingdom and a dominion without end. Nearly everything John says in the Revelation reflects a phrase, an incident, or a verse from the Hebrew Bible. And he likes to use biblical phrases. And so when he says here, I saw one like the Son of Man, he's quoting Daniel. And he is connecting what he saw with what Daniel saw. So this one whom we understand to be Jesus is the fulfillment of Daniel's vision. Reason for which Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man. And later in the book of Revelation, you'll have the same phrase. I saw one like the Son of Man ready to harvest the world. So lampstands, we're told these are churches. The Son of Man from Daniel refers to a human being who would rule forever. And the robe and the sash, as you pointed out, sounds like the description of the costume of the high priest as given in Exodus. And was Jesus ever called a high priest? Yeah, 15 times, but only in the book of Hebrews, which is important because that was primary New Testament Jewish Christian text. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining with full force. Does that sound like Jesus? Now, he was only 30-some years old. Why would he have white hair? In fact, we're not even told here specifically that this is Jesus. Yet, does this sound like any other text that you read in the Bible? I ask that because I also have forgotten until I looked it up. Ezekiel's description. Ezekiel. And as we shall see also in Daniel. I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen, with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the roar of a multitude. So I was left alone to see this great vision. And you see the semblance. It's almost an exact parallel between what Daniel sees and what John sees. Again, the revelation is picking up where the book of Daniel left off. It is now filling in the details of what is to come. But he's called a man. Verse 5, I saw a man. It doesn't say I saw a god or an angel, or does it? I don't know, it wasn't supposed to pop up yet. But since it did, very often in the Hebrew Bible, when there's the appearance of a spirit messenger from God, it's actually called a man. And whenever angels appear in the Bible, they look like humans. And Jennifer and I saw one once. We'll tell you that story later. Anyway, we think we did. So who is this glorious being that has appeared to John? Let me refer you back to the very first verse of the book. 
The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants what must soon take place. And he, Christ, made it known by sending his, what? Sending his angels to his servant John. Does Jesus have an angel? Good. The angel of the Lord. There's an idea. Let's compare this with uh, Exodus 23, where Yahweh is speaking to Moses about his angel. I am going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him, or he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. All right, thank you. So we have this several instances in the Hebrew Bible where Yahweh sends an angel who represents Yahweh, who speaks for him, and is called Yahweh. And reason for which, he says, I'm that angel I send, my name will be in him. Well, when the name of Yahweh is in something, what does that imply? It, it is he himself. Now, Yahweh, the eternal God, Scripture declares, no one has ever seen God, nor can they. He is invisible. However, he can send a representation of himself. So I have an hypothesis. You don't have to agree with it, but this is the way I think. Yahweh, God, remains forever the invisible spirit. You don't walk into heaven and shake the Father's hand. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, or angel of Yahweh, sometimes appeared to humans in human form. I guess he can do anything he wants. And Yahweh came into the world as the human Jesus. He was actually born a complete human being. But risen from death, Jesus then appeared to hundreds of human witnesses as a human being who had wounds in his wrists, a stab wound room in his side, and lateral wounds through his heels. He did not look like a high priest with glowing white hair. Now this same Jesus remains in heaven as our high priest. He doesn't keep coming back down. So what did he do? Jesus sent this revelation through his angel, who had appeared to Daniel and is now appearing to John. Well, does that make sense that the angel of Yahweh of the Old Testament could be identified with the angel of Jesus in the New Testament? I guess I didn't follow your thought process. Are you saying that you think that this angel is Jesus, or this angel is Jesus's spokesperson? And then, well, just as the angel of the Lord was the visible presence of the invisible Yahweh, the same angel of the Lord is now sent by Jesus to appear and speak with John <coughs> as Jesus. When we start talking about spiritual stuff, and who is who and who is what and so forth in the scripture, it doesn't really fit modern Western concepts. We like to categorize things rather carefully, but one of the mysteries of the Bible is that the invisible God can appear in a visible form, and that the pure spirit Yahweh can actually live on earth as a real human being, fully God, fully man. Anyway, the book of Revelation says, Jesus sent his angel to reveal these things to John. So what we have here is a description of that angel, who when he speaks will discover is Jesus speaking through that angel, as we shall see in the following verses. So you could say he's an ambassador that speaks for the one who sent him. That's a good analogy. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and of death and of hell. Now write what you have seen, what is, and what is to take place after this. An angel touched him. It did. Uh, can angels do that? Yeah, yeah. Apparently. <laughs> I mean, even the angel of the Lord, when he appeared to little Samuel uh, in the tabernacle, the scripture actually says that the angel of the Lord came and stood 
at the head of his bed, and they interacted. Samuel actually heard him speak. What we're dealing here with then is revelation, that is to say, the eternal, invisible, spiritual God reveals to us humans, in human form, in human speech, in human visions, the truth about himself. Now, why did John fall down like that? Was that an act of worship? Afraid. Sure. He was afraid. It says right here, the angel touches him and says, do not be afraid. What do we learn about Jesus from this passage? Well, I am the first and the last and the living one. Mm -hmm. I was dead and I see alive. See, I am alive. Je Jesus was part of Yahweh. And of course, this is the angel speaking, but these these would obviously are Jesus' words, you know. But he also holds the keys of death. And then when he was when he was crucified, you know, before he was raised, he was in Hades and essentially put Satan and the other spirits on notice that you're soon going to be done. You are done. Well put. So that he's the first and the last. He starts these things, the things he has started, he will complete. Well, I see that as he's reaffirming what John's been preaching. All right, that's good. good observation. He also calls himself the living one. And Jesus called, once called himself the living one. All right, he holds the keys of death in Hades. What's the point? He can either lock or unlock. He can lock or unlock. And if someone is in prison and you unlock the doors, what can happen? You can leave. Quite so. Anyway, what you have seen, and he, he's describing right now what he saw, and what is, that is, the things going on in the present time on earth, and then what is going to happen next, which we'll get into next week, Lord willing. So Jesus is affirming also his death and resurrection. Will he ever die again? No, he's now alive forevermore. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right. Instantly clear, right? <laughs> what needs some unpacking? Well, what about the seven stars, or angels, of the seven churches? There we have the, that crazy uh, English expression again, of the churches, which is so ambiguous. You don't already know what he means, you're left wondering. Which has given rise to several theories over the years. <clears throat> Some have suggested that this refers to the seven archangels, two of whom are named in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, but you have to go out of the Bible to discover the names of the rest of them. And so there are seven archangels named specifically in the ancient book of Enoch. Did Enoch ever in the Bible? No, this was an ancient uh, Jewish writing that is actually quoted a couple of times in the New Testament. So it was widely read, widely understood, and the language was useful. Right, the second theory suggests that this stands for <clears throat> the bishops of the seven churches. Right, others say, well, this is another personification of the churches. They spread the light, but they're also called angels because the churches are sent by God into the world. You can preach that. Wouldn't necessarily be accurate, but you could make a great sermon. Or are these messengers from the churches who have come to visit John on the Isle of Patmos? To one, it says, the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. In fact, if all seven of them are there, perhaps you could dictate to them and let them write it down. So anyway, here are the seven churches. All of them are daughter churches of the mother church in Ephesus. However, there were some other churches in the same region that are not mentioned here. Colossians. Colossians is actually, there's an epistle written to Colossians. The church of Ephesus, who founded the church of Ephesus? Who was the apostle who started that work? Paul. That was Paul, as far as we know because the incidents and the troubles that he had and the persecutions are all mentioned in the book of Acts and they have the epistle to the Ephesians. He also wrote the epistle to the Colossians 
But Colossians is not mentioned here, perhaps because Paul actually did not found the church at Colossae. It was founded by a layman named Epaphras. All right, here's what we'd like to do next. I'm going to ask each of you to find a study partner whom you're seated near, and to let each one of you read an assigned passage, which I shall distribute in a moment. And then the other one can... So stop at any moment and write a verse number and a word or two under each topic. And after about five to seven minutes, you will be ready to report on, on what you found in the passage. A few moments later... If you've ever studied uh, the book of Revelation with evangelical preachers, at least if you go back half a century or more, which you and I can do, can we? Some of us can. It used to be trendy, a common practice, to equate each of these seven churches with some phase or of, uh, of future church history. Since this was book predicted the future, the suggestion that we used to hear was that the church of Ephesus represented the apostolic age from about the year 33 to the end of the century. <clears throat> and that was supposed to be very strong firm, correct churches, like the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Remember, those churches were all started by apostles. How strong were they? How doctrinally correct were they? How obedient were they? Then the next, the Smyrna church, they said this described, this is the period of persecutions, which endured for about a century, until the time of Constantine, when the persecutions let up, which then led into the so-called Dark Ages, 300 to 600 AD. Thyatira, I probably also butchered it. The time, this was the growth then of Catholicism. Under state sponsorship, one church in Rome, through government intervention and the use of armies and military, was able to impose itself on many regions of uh, of Europe and the Middle East, which then continued until about 1563. What happened that year? The launch of the so-called Reformation, perhaps the nailing of the 95 Theses on the Württemberg Cathedral door. But from then, we had, from that time, the Sardis Church represented the multiplication of denominations, including Protestants, which eventually birthed evangelicals, which eventually burned, and, and some false denominations as well. Then the Philadelphia would be, from about the middle of the 19th century, the great missionary age, when some Western powers were now wealthy enough and biblical enough that they could send personnel to many parts of the world that, were still, that either had formerly heard the gospel but had been overrun by enemies, such as Africa, and North Africa in particular, and continues harshly to this day. However, that was a very costly age. You know, until the, event, the discovery of anti-malarial drugs, what was the average lifespan of a European who went, say, to um, West Africa? One about year. three months. <laughs> well, the average was about one year. And the missionaries used to pack their kit in a wooden coffin. And I myself, in my travels, have come across some of the old burial sites and graveyards of those who lived one, two, three years. They mostly died of malaria or black fever. And then Laodicea would represent the period of apostasy, which some equate with today. However, there's some problems with this theory. How would you critique this idea of these churches representing future phases of history. Here are some, why well, I think it is not likely that these are phases of history. First, all of those churches existed in John's day, that is the seven churches, and they all read the Apocalypse. So those were obviously historical churches. Secondly, those churches began to disappear in the 1500s. Why? 
Islam. Islam. They, when that region, when Asia Minor was conquered by the Turks coming out of Central Asia, the uh, churches began to disappear. This gave rise to what was called the Ottoman Empire, which endured for about 500 years. And remember, there were churches with similar strengths and weaknesses in every century. Fourthly, if those were future churches, then readers of the book of Revelation, of Revelation never knew who, where, or when they were. And lastly, preachers who do not study history often make up ideas for which there is no evidence.